Good afternoon. My name is Dorothy Burridge, and I'm the Regional Education Coordinator with the Central East Stroke Network. And on behalf of the Central East Stroke Network, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today, Four Birds with One Stone, Reparative Neuroplastic Cardiorespiratory and the Metabolic Benefits of Aerobic Exercise Post-Stroke, presented by Dr. Michelle Plowman. Uh, before I turn it over to our presenter, though, I would like to remind you that you are welcome to submit questions by typing them into the question section of your control panel. And we will have some time at the end of this presentation to try and address some of your, your questions. So I'm pleased to introduce our presenter today. Dr. Plowman is a physiotherapist and neuroscientist, a recognized expert in neuroplasticity and neurorehabilitation in stroke and multiple sclerosis. Her research focuses on the effects of aerobic exercise, intensive training paradigms, and lifestyle habits on the brain challenged by injury, disease, and aging. Dr. Plowman is a Canada Research Chair in Neuroplasticity, Neurorehabilitation, and Brain Recovery. Her work is published in journals such as Stroke, Neuroscience, Brain Research, and Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Dr. Plowman continues to practice as a neurological physiotherapist in St. John's, and her recovery and performance lab is located in the Rehab Research Unit in St. John's, Newfoundland. So it's my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Dr. Plowman. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. And uh, we'll move right along. What I hope to cover is to speak about the limited time window that we have to act in terms of stroke recovery. And I'll be focusing on sensory motor control because that's the area I have the most experience with. But I also recognize that there's a body of literature, for example, in speech language pathology that suggests that the window of recovery is a little bit later than what I'll propose to you in terms of sensory motor recovery. Uh, we'll talk about the mismatch between research and practice, how aerobic exercise affects brain repair, um, neuroplasticity, and cardiorespiratory and metabolic benefits of aerobic exercise, and then the results of uh, our recent uh, clinical trial. So let's start with some old work, and, and we've seen this before. This is the uh, results from the Scandinavian stroke study, the Copenhagen stroke study, where they monitored thousands of patients over their admission. And what they showed is that whether you're going to examine uh, the arm or the leg, there is this window of recovery. And on this slide, you'll see that the percentage of maximum recovery achieved is on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis. And these lines represent patients' groups at, at different levels of severity. So on the top, these the diamonds, the black diamonds, represent patients who have a very mild stroke. This is upper extremity impairment. And then the uh, shaded circles on the bottom with patients with more severe stroke. But what you see is this trajectory that over time, patients begin to plateau. And that plateau is happening about the 12 week mark when they're reaching their maximum recovery. So you would say, you know, this is pretty old research. Maybe we're doing things differently now. We have better technology to actually measure impairment. And in fact, we do, and this work is from Sean Dukalau's lab in the University of Calgary, and he uses the kin arm, so some of you may be familiar with this device, where it can actually examine the torques that the arm is, is able to provide at the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist forearm. And what you see is that with his several hundred patients that he mapped over time from one week to 26 weeks, and this is their uh, performance scores. You also see this trend towards a flattening out at 12 weeks. So it seems that we have this period where most of the recovery is happening. It's not to say that patients can't get more recovery after 12 weeks. It's just that this happens to be the most robust period. Well, why is this? And so in animal models, we've shown that this 
recovery or window is biologic. And we have two things happening during this period. One is that you have an upregulation of growth promoting factors. So in this figure, it's on the top in the red. And so things like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, nerve growth factor, the stroke itself stimulates the upregulation of these factors, and it provides a strong environment for neuroplasticity to occur. But what's happening on the other side of that is that we begin to get, at the 12-week mark, this upregulation of growth inhibiting factors. Because, of course, it's not sensible for the brain to be massively plastic and to keep connecting because uh, it could potentially be abnormal. So the brain sort of sets a halt to this and uh, by upregulating things like no-go protein. So it, it halts. So this is the window is really a neurobiological um, air phenomenon. So what else is about what's happening at this stage in the patient's recovery? So this figure is from a paper that my student, Liam Kelly, and I published. And what we did is we consolidated all the research that was available on fitness levels. So because we asked the question, well, some patients may just be so deconditioned that they can't participate in the high levels of the therapy, the thousands of practice that they have to do in order to promote plasticity. So we first did, um, so on this figure you'll see some numbers on the very bottom, one, two, three, four, five to ten, and this is met. So sedentary would be one met. For you to walk around indoors in your environment is around 3.3 met. For you to do your regular ADLs outside and inside your home, would be about 4.5 mets, roughly. Walking stairs, about six mets. So on the top are adjusted mets. So this accounts for the fact that patients, because of their hemiplegia, use about 50% more energy to move around than someone without hemiplegia. And we collected all the data that was available at the time from these five studies that are here on the left-hand side, Dakuna, Philho, Tang, Duncan, McKay, Lyons, Billinger. And when we examined all their fitness tests of their subjects who were involved in their trials, so these were community, people living in the community with stroke, who were mild enough to participate in these trials, exercise trials, what you see is that for every one of them, their MET values are below 3 and below the adjusted level 4.5. So even regardless of their neurological impairment, their fitness levels are actually too low to participate in any kind of functional um, outdoor activities. And what we suspect is that these low levels create a ceiling to neuromotor recovery. It limits both the number of repetitions that can be completed within a session and the total intensity at which they can be sustained. So here, there are many other factors conspiring against optimal recovery. We just spoke about the extremely low activity tolerance, but also humans are optimizers, and they quickly look to learn in any way possible using compensatory strategies. So patients will quickly uh, choose to use their unaffected hand to eat, to move themselves around in bed. And remember what I told you about you have this window of opportunity where the brain is reset because of the trauma to the brain. These neurotrophins are upregulated. Well, if you're using neuroplasticity capacity in order to improve the function of your unaffected arm, what this does is rob the brain's ability to, to connect with the affected arm. And this, studies, this has been shown actually in animal models by Teresa Jones. So optimization is it's, when it's happening too early, it's not necessarily good for plasticity. We also see a heightened safety culture. We see this throughout our hospital, um, these yellow fall risk bands that, that sort of indicate to staff, but are also indicating to the patient and to their family members that they're better off to stay put rather than move around because of fall risk. Other factors include early fitting of AFOs, the ankle, foot, orthoses, and canes to hasten discharge. 
And there also is a structure within rehabilitation that patients go to therapies, but there's not often in the Canadian and the U.S. healthcare system, there's not often attention to the time that's happening in between those times. And so we'll see uh, that some, most patients are sedentary, and I'll show you some of that data. And then, of course, our patients have multiple other comorbid conditions, and the recent Heart and Stroke Foundation report said that 90% of its stroke patients admitted to rehabilitation have five other comorbid conditions. So here we are. Um, patients have extremely low fitness. There's a lot of things conspiring against really good rehabilitation. And could care on a stroke rehabilitation unit be considered stroke recovery boot camp? And um, we decided to investigate that in our own facility. And what we found, long and short of it, was that our facility looked actually very similar to facilities uh, in Australia. Julie Bernhardt's group has, have evaluated this, and in the US and in the UK. So what we did is we, we took one quarter of the year's new admissions. We asked them one at a time as they were admitted within one week of admission if they would wear our one lead ECG. And so this has an accelerometer as well as a heart rate monitor and we, we um, tape that onto a shaved chest. And we're able then to map uh, human behavior over time and the, the, how much the person's moving about. And you'll see that really less than 7% of a person's time on the weekday is, is in actual structured therapies. The rest of the time is moving about between leisure, rest, ADL, and 40% of the time is in sleep. And then the weekend looks very similar to that. What is usually very helpful with using this one lead ECG is that we could do exactly what we had done with the MET. So now we can look at heart rate and activity levels, and we can determine the MET levels of activities during the day. So you see these heat maps. On the y-axis are participants. So these were the 19 people of the 28 who agreed to wear our monitors. And then on the x-axis, the time of day from 8 in the morning until 8 in the evening. And then the heat represents black is sedentary, so 1.5 mets or below, and red is uh, above 4 mets. So remember what I told you, you need about 4.5 to be able to be functional in your community. So just have a little glance of that heat map, and you'll see some things. And what you see is that the majority of participants, the patients that we measured, were sedentary most of the time. And in fact, our data show that 91% of their time is spent completely sedentary. And that during therapy, there were some patients, about half, who during occupational therapy and physiotherapy did reach um, into a training zone. And of course, the, the the clinicians, the physios, and the OTs will immediately, your eye is drawn to participant number eight. Um, participant number eight uh, is a very special participant. He's one of those people, and you've seen these, who has his own mind about what he's going to do. He is a young 45-year-old fisherman who had an ischemic stroke. Uh, and when I would come in on the weekends, because my lab is actually in the rehab center, he would be in the stairwells walking up and down the stairwell. So that's him, number eight, and he certainly stood out. But the rest look very similar. We also saw a phenomenon that we've brought forward in that patients are uh, being placed in bed around 7.30, and which represents sort of the end of the nursing shift. So it makes us think that we're providing really um, nursing or clinician-centered care uh, rather than patient-centered care, and how we can utilize all this time between therapies and in the evenings to enrich the environment. So in other parts of the world, and uh, they're starting to work on this, and this is a paper from Japan, and they examined uh, almost 7,000 stroke patients in 14 acute hospitals 
over a nine-year period. And they collect data on all, all kinds of aspects of what they're providing, the amount of therapy, who's providing the therapy, exactly the types of activities that are being, uh, being uh, provided. So something like our National Rehab Reporting System, except much richer data. Uh, they talk about who, uh, if there's orthotics, how much counseling is provided, education, recreational programming, uh, for example. <clears throat> And what they did, many of you are familiar with the functional independence measure. It ranges from 7 to 126. And that the performance of our hospitals is, is often examined by the change that we make in this functional independence measure. And most people believe that efficiency is about one, meaning that for every day a patient is admitted in our hospital, they would change about one point on the SIM. So this Japanese group took that one, one, that one dim efficiency and they examined the characteristics of hospitals that were higher than one, so high performing hospitals, and ones that were lower than one, so lower performing hospitals. And if you look at the Canadian data through the National Rehab Reporting System portal, uh, on average Canada is around the 0.7. So you can see that we'd be a, just between the M and the N hospital here in Japan. And when you examine the high performance and the low performance hospitals, I'd like for you to look at those numbers on the top. You can see that the high performance hospitals, about the disproportionately higher number of patients were seen in those hospitals. In general, patients did better. Um, they had more gains. Uh, they had a um, shorter, but shorter length of Day. A greater number of them were, were discharged. They had more therapy. They uh, had more involvement by a board certified physiatrist. They did more self exercise, weekend exercise. They had exercise prescribed to them on the ward, so they had homework to do. Um, and fewer of them were prescribed a leg brace, but not that much lower. And they had participation of a social worker. And what the what the authors pointed out, they said, is patients in the high-performance hospitals received a higher amount of PTOT, um, ST must be speech therapy, and early rehabilitation. Patients in high-performance hospitals conducted more self-exercise, weekend exercise, and exercise in wards. There was more participation of board-certified physiatrists and social workers in high-performance hospitals. So I, I would call this an enriched environment. And there are several new papers out about how we can practically provide enriched environment in the current climate that we have with the amount of staff that we have. And you have to be creative in order to do that, but it's an interesting area. So let's go back to um, aerobic exercise and how we're really hitting those four birds with one stone. And I became interested in this because um, we all, you know, as a physiotherapist, I had my patient with me perhaps an hour a day if I was lucky, and then um, I, I would give them some exercises to do in their room. So I have a minimal amount of time, and, and I want to choose interventions that will have the most robust benefits. And so I became interested in how much aerobic exercise could potentially have on all these outcomes. And I'm going to just touch on some data that we've consolidated from all the research in animal models and in clinical trials that talk about how aerobic exercise can have these broad effects on repair systems, plasticity, fitness, and metabolic health. And the, the chart that I have on the right, it looks a bit uh, busy, but actually when you look at it, these are things that you know. So on the y-axis, you'll see F-I-T-T-I. So F being the frequency, so how frequently do you need to do the training to get the benefit? The intensity, so the percentage of maximum. The time, so the time in terms of the time for that session as well as the duration in weeks. The type, whether it's intermittent or continuous. And the initiation, so how soon after a stroke are, can you safely employ this aerobic exercise and have benefit? So in terms of brain repair outcomes, we looked at animal models, so we lesion volume, uh, restoration, improvement of inflammation, 
improvement of neurogenesis. So you do have new cells being built inside your brain. We don't know the role of those, but they do exist. And geogenesis, which is the growth of new blood vessels, which are important to support the penumbra as it heals um, and the reduction in stress. And what we learned was that if you were looking at these biomarkers in animal models, you really need to do 20 to 30 minutes early initiated, so one to three days post-stroke, low intensity. So if you did high intensity, it tended to uh, exacerbate the, the uh, injury, the, the ischemic injury, most days of the, days of the week. So this is how that uh, the, the FIDI principles applied for brain repair outcomes. So I'm just going to touch a little bit on what we understand about how the brain changes after stroke before I hit on the neuroplasticity. So when I graduated from the School of Physiotherapy in 1988, you know, the term neuroplasticity didn't actually exist. It was being studied in the psychology realm about kittens and about the visual um, studies using kittens examining the appearance of uh, visual field deficits and the critical period for vision. But really in terms of brain injury and stroke, it wasn't discussed. So it wasn't until Randy Nudo began to show how our interventions as therapists actually changed brain uh, connections that we started to be aware of neuroplasticity, and this was around 1994, 1995. And what he did is he he used the macaque monkey as his model, and he was able to do a craniotomy, so he removed that section of the cranium. Then he used intracortical microstimulation to map out, so he stimulated the motor cortex because remember your body is mapped on your brain like a homunculus. So he was able to map the brain find the area that was responsible for the hand, and then he would cauterize all the vessels around that hand area and cause the animal to have a very focal stroke involving the forearm and the hand. Then he created two treatments. So one treatment was the little jacket. So you can see the monkey there is wearing the jacket, and it's a constraint-induced jacket where it forces the animal to use his affected paw. So as he's going around the cage. So the monkey is in the cage with his other friend. So he has to interact and groom and, and defend himself inside the cage, but he can only use his affected forearm and arm. Then the second thing that Dr. Nudo developed was this reaching apparatus. And so the animal started with his food pellets given in the big bowl. So all he had to do was really scoop this the pellets out and he could put them in his mouth. And then as the animal got better and better with his reaching, they made the little bowl smaller. And so that in order to get the food from the bowl, the animal had to reach in with just his uh, thumb and his first digit. So it was a challenging task. The animal wants to eat, but he's, you're making the, the challenge more and more difficult. So in this panel, in panel A, you'll see the, the, the surface of the brain. And then B, you can see three months post-infarct, you can see that that little grayish area is an area where he cauterized, so he, he caused death of the surface cortical neurons there. C is the intracortical mapping that he did. And you can see that where the circle is, this is before the stroke, you can see he found the digit areas, so they're red. And then in the panel D, now that same circle is black, and black being no response. So two things you know, that's one thing that, that shows up clearly. But the second thing is, look at how much the rest of the map is changing. You see a huge reduction in the pink, even in areas that there was no stroke. So the animal stopped using his hand, and as a result, his motor map is shifting, even areas that are not involved in the stroke. And he has lots of representation of his hand area. And it's interesting that the, this effect has been seen using fMRI as well in human beings. So let's go back to Randy Nudo and his training that he developed. So in this figure, you'll see on the y-axis is the percentage change in the representations after one month. So 
So if you have a zero, it means that there's no change. So if we look at his different treatments, if you leave the animal to spontaneously recover, you can see that there's loss of mass in the distal forelimb, in the digit, and the wrist and forearm. With the jacket, but no training, you also see this loss. It might not be as severe, but there's still loss of that mass area. It's only when you combine that intensive rehabilitative training and the jacket that you had um, sparing and improvement of the area and also this parallel, the animal had better recovery. So what we've learned back since 1995, we've examined, understand this principle. Um, we're starting now to use MRI, fMRI, uh, near-infrared spectroscopy, and other ways to look at brain activation patterns in humans. And what this slide shows, and, and I'll explain it in a basic way, when you have a small stroke, when you have an area that perhaps just the arm is involved, you have enough redundancy all around the stroke, in the edges around the stroke, there are areas that are intimately connected. They might not be primarily activating the hand, but they're able to participate in that. They can activate, and studies have shown, that they now start to take over some of the work of the hand. When you have a larger stroke, you begin to pull in areas outside of that region. And then when you have a very large stroke, you have you start to pull in areas in the other hemisphere. So that's how the brain recovers. So back in my doctoral work, I asked this question, well, you know, you're delivering something. For example, Randy Noodle was delivering this. It's very intense. He's two weeks of this training every single day for hours and hours. And the proposal was that what his training was doing was that it was increasing these neurotrophins, brain-derived neurotrophic factor was one of them, and that these were helping to uh, strengthen synapses within the brain. So my first question is to say, okay, well, how much exercise do you need to do? How much training do you need to do to upregulate these neurotrophins and then promote recovery? And what I showed is that when we were looking at lower extremity impairment, that um, on the right-hand side of this panel, you'll see we did 30 minutes of running, so a lot of our high-intensity practice. We did a walking, which is lower-intensity practice, and then I did 60, so longer but still lower-intensity, voluntary and sedentary. And you can see that the 30 minutes of walking, so that was the moderate intensity, still upregulated this BDNF. So the next question I ask is whether you could Hair. So what about if you could use exercise, so aerobic exercise at a moderate amount, and prime the brain? So if you paired this with upper limb training and you increase these neurotrophins, perhaps what you can do is make the brain more amenable to change, theoretically. And I showed that that's, a, in fact, what happened in an animal model of stroke. So in this slide, you, you'll see on the y-axis the pre-stroke reaching performance. On the bottom is time. So I developed training where the animals would reach in the wells, just like Randy Nudo did, and I would work with them a couple of hours every day to reach into the well. Some just had reaching, some had just had running practice on a motorized wheel that I controlled the speed, and some had both running before reaching. And you can see on this slide that in black, the animals receiving no rehab, no surprise, they don't improve. But the animals receiving the running before the reaching, that's the red squares, they improve the most. So this gave us the idea that, yes, you can prime the brain with aerobic exercise, that intensity is important, but also what you're delivering is important and how you're delivering it. And what I showed is that when you look at the other hemisphere where most of the plasticity is occurring, that you have more staining of dendrites, which tells us that we're helping the brain connect. And I'm sort of telling you these stories because it helped me sort of understand what my hands were doing because I think sometimes we have a disconnect with our patient. We, we know we're doing something, something happens, our patients are better, but what is it we're actually doing? Well, we're acting on the brain. We're upregulating these neurotrophins. They're the ones that are strengthening the synapses. 
So what you do and the intensity of what you do matters. And I'll tell you the story about uh, a colleague of mine, Anna Hicks, who was doing a study in the lab at the same time I was. And she, her idea was, well, let's just put stem cells inside these brains. And of course, stem cells now is a hot topic. But back then, it was an emerging area back in 2007. So what she would do is she would take the stem cells and she would label them with a fluorescent green protein. You can see them here. And she injected them around where the stroke was. And what we found was that these green cells would sort of lay on top of the corpus callosum and they didn't, didn't seem to do anything. They just were like a blob. And the animals didn't change at all. So I said, well, why don't you, I just did the study with my enriched environment, my reaching and my physio training. I said, why don't you put your cells in there and then put your animals through my training and see what happens. And what you can see on the right-hand side is this amazing thing. You know, the steps, the stem cells start spreading all over. It's, I think it's silly to think that you could just put stem cells or just provide brain stimulation or just provide a drug and think that the brain knows what to do. I think you need that physiotherapy signal uh, or occupational therapy signal, some behavioral signal to tell the cells what to do. So it was an interesting finding when you uh, put people's heads together. So in the next study I did, I blocked BDNF because I asked the question, well, does it matter? I mean, if, we can, if it's all about neurotrophins, if you block this, then we should lose our benefit of our treatment. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. On the bottom of this figure, it's very similar to what I just showed you, but the red or scarlet color is the animal that received rehabilitation, and I was able to block the BDNF using a chemical block. The animals that had the vehicle in the blue, they recovered as per expected. So this tells us that what we do means something. It's having this biological effect. And we're also beginning to believe now, like I showed you before, that there is this critical window. And Jeff Bernaski, who was in our lab at the same, at the same time I was, showed that, in fact, it does matter when you deliver it. So when you deliver treatment in the animal model, around five or 14 days. So you can see here the percentage of pellets eaten that's in our reaching task. And on the bottom is uh, the three different groups, the enriched training and begun at five days, 14 days, and 30 days. So if you provide rehabilitation starting at 30 days, it's really not that beneficial at all. So it means that we have a window. And the AVERT trial has told us that you probably can't start too early, so before 24 hours is probably not recommended. But actually, if you start too late, this little, this period you have where neurotrophins are robustly upregulated is starting to wane. So you, you, we have an opportunity to act. We have to do the right thing. So here are some of the rules that we've learned over the years. The rules of neuroplasticity are time dependency. So there's an upregulation of growth proteins after stroke. They create this optimal environment for neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity and recovery are reduced when rehabilitation is delayed. And neuroplasticity and recovery occur best during a critical window. And there's dose dependency. So neuroplasticity and recovery require highly intensive task-specific training, thousands of repetitions. I haven't touched on this data, but it's pretty strong, and that when patients start to use their better hand or their better leg really early on, the neuroplasticity is being used to make their better side better. Um, I'm going to skip some of this and go on to... Um, so I'm going to now focus on the other outcomes and metabolic health. So we actually don't know that much about providing aerobic exercise and stroke to improve metabolic health. We can really only borrow knowledge taken from uh, work in heart failure patients and other cardiac like MI and cardiac rehab patients. But studies examining the effects of aerobic exercise show that aerobic exercise can be safely implemented as early as five days, even among those with moderate to severe impairment. The optimal training seems to be three to five days a week, moderate to vigorous intensity, 20 to 60 minutes per session, 
for 12 weeks, and that using the cardiac rehab model, so in, uh, in commu more community living people, uh, actually does improve the similar risk for scores as, as if they were cardiac patients. So if you notice, this is a little bit different than I showed you for brain repair, because brain repair was lower intensity and early. So it's something to think about. It depends on what you're interested in. So I think in the end, these lines we drew right across to sort of say, well, how can we hit these? What is the intensity of training required to hit all four birds with one stone? So frequency is for aerobic exercise would be three to five times a week. The intensity is more towards the 60% of maximum, so the vigorous intensity. And I would argue that um, our patients would be very unusual to be reaching this kind of training. In fact, most Canadians don't reach this type of training. 30 minutes, greater than eight weeks, and continuous, although there's some emerging evidence for high intensity interval training. So this is what we've learned, that we can use aerobic exercise to change repair, promote repair, promote plasticity, to attack cardiorespiratory fitness and improve metabolic parameters. I'm going to skip this. This is, this is really, um, uh, it's in our paper, Four Birds with One Stone, which you can get online. And it's, and it's a proposed method of how to implement this kind of intensity early on. And, and what we mean is that in the phases where you're, say for example, in your four, first four weeks post-stroke, we would call that your initial recovery phase. You're going to provide training density that's fairly low, and it's going to build up over time. So you can see that we've uh, provided a map. So day three to six, for example, we, you might only do 25 minutes. The intensity is extremely low, and that you would build this over time until you got into the community and you were able to do the high intensity training. This is something that we're about to, to test. So now I'm gonna sort of put all this together. So we've talked about this window of plasticity. We've talked about how intense you need to provide therapy. And so what I decided to do for one of my first randomized control trials is ask the question whether aerobic exercise can prime the brain. And the outcome I chose was fluid intelligence. And I chose this for two reasons. One, because, well, aerobic exercise, when you undergo aerobic exercise, it's usually on a treadmill or on a new step or a bicycle. You're using your arms and most often you're using your legs. So you can have improvements in walking. So you can improve walking or arm function because you're actually moving, you're strengthening the muscles, you're improving range of motion, you're probably with the rhythmical motion, you're maybe even reducing spasticity. Well, that's not necessarily changing the neurological impairment. It's changing other factors that can improve function. So I chose cognition because I said, well, the only way you can improve cognition is through plasticity. There is no, you can't improve range of motion of cognition or spasticity of cognition. The only thing you can change is the wiring within the brain. And I chose the primary outcome as the Raven's progressive matrices, which is really a puzzle. You have to solve the puzzle. The average person has never seen these puzzles before. They don't require any language or explanation. It's very simple. You point to the empty box and you ask the participant to point to which one of the panels fits into the empty box. And I'll give you a moment to just look at that and see, can you figure out which one of the panels fits into the empty box? The first one is pretty easy, but with this tool, it gets more and more difficult. Now try to figure out which panel fits into the empty box. And you can see this one is much more difficult. So what a great tool. There's really no ceiling effect. We don't have to worry about uh, language, and I can test whether aerobic exercise has any effect on this outcome. So we engaged two sites. We had one in St. John's, and there were about 40 patients in St. John's, 
and uh, 15 patients in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And we had patients who were living in the community. They had to have at, be able to at least walk 10 feet with assistance. So some patients were, were um, highly affected by their stroke. There were four groups. One group received aerobic training on body weight support treadmill at this moderate to high intensity training for 30 minutes, followed by dual and back training. So dual and back training is computerized training for you. It's a working memory, very challenging task developed by Gail Eskies in uh, Dalhousie University, who's a neuropsychologist. So one group received aerobic training and dual and back. The other received aerobic training and games, and the game was just a matched computer game playing Tetris. And the other group received activity. So the activity was based on my experience working as a physiotherapist, doing just functional tasks that people would need to do every day, like stepping up, stepping down, balancing on one foot, doing crossovers, getting down on the floor and back up again. And we, we treated it like a circuit, so we had tasks that were very challenging, tasks that were easy. And we, we moved in between them, and we tried to keep the task at around 40% of uh, heart rate max, so in the light to moderate zone. So we had a group that had activity, functional activity, and cognitive training, and functional activity and games. So you can start to think, well, which do you think? Which group do you think would have the most improvement in cognitive performance at the end of 10 weeks, three times a week? This is how the results looked. So in terms of fluid intelligence, the two groups that had significant improvement in fluid intelligence was the aerobic cog group and the activity cog group. So in this figure, it's the red circle and the blue triangle. But when you examine their change in fluid intelligence score from baseline, it was only the aerobic and cog group that was significantly different and significantly improved compared to our activity in games, which was our control. And what you see is that the actually the activity games group gradually got worse over time. That's the green group, although it wasn't significantly so. They did tend to go down. We also showed that this aerobic COG group had the greatest improvements. The aerobic games and the aerobic COG both had improvements in fitness. And it was the aerobic and COG group that also had improvements in walking speed. So I think that when you add aerobic fitness, you're adding in this very potent treatment. It's not just about cardiovascular fitness there are probably effects directly on the brain. And what we showed was that we were interested in a couple of blood biomarkers. Uh, one was BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which I talked to you before about, and the other was insulin-like growth factor, one, which is another neurotropin known to promote plasticity in the brain. And what we found was that patients who had the greatest increases in this IGF-1 at baseline tended to have the most improvement, 40% uh, more improvement in fluid intelligence score. So the message from this trial was that adding aerobic exercise into your intervention does improve fitness, does improve walking speed, does improve cognition when it's matched, when it's paired with cognitive tasks. It's a potent treatment that has broad effects. It does affect four birds with one stone. So going back you know, to our functional task training, it wasn't as potent as aerobic exercise, but keep in mind that there are some patients who you, for whatever reason, can't fit in aerobic exercise. They don't have the capacity to go on the treadmill. You may not have the equipment. So we looked a little closer at our functional task practice to see if that would meet aerobic training guidelines, because these are tasks that you're doing all the time with your patients. And what we found was that, here's a snapshot of the 10 patients uh, in the subgroup that we have data on that we were able to, so they wore masks and we can look at the metabolic cost of functional task practice. And what we showed was that the, 
in terms of VO2 heart rate reserve and the predicted heart rate reserve, the relative intensity of our functional task practice was above the 40% mark. So if you choose to do um, task practice and you continuously do it for 20 minutes and try to reduce your rest periods, you can actually receive your patient does receive some aerobic training benefit. It's not high intensity, but it's in the moderate intensity zone. So that's good, that's good news because it gives us uh, more tools in our toolbox, and that way we can do two things. We're improving uh, aerobic fitness, but we're also helping the patient regain those important functional skills. And this gives you some idea about the metabolic equivalent of some of the tasks that we're doing in our functional task practice. So stair climbing was above our four in our mat, uh, prone, so getting from the prone to standing position was above four. Step ups to a 20 inch uh, surface was also above our metabolic equivalent of four. So um, we're coming to the end of my talk and uh, this is the paper and if anybody wants the paper I can send it out to you which really consolidates everything I talked to you about today. And these are all the important uh, trainees in the lab, many of them, specialists in motor learning. Augustine is a physiotherapist. Liam is an exercise physiologist. I'm a physiotherapist. Arthur's a neuroscientist. Megan is studying to be a doctor. So, you know, we have a really interdisciplinary group. We try to think through problems and uh, create innovative solutions. Uh, that are that really are practical and can be applied in everyday settings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Plowman. Um, so at this time, I'd really encourage you, if you have any questions, to please type them into the question section of the control panel. So we, we do have a few minutes to address can, any of your questions. Um, I also will let you know that this webinar has been recorded and it will be re-archived on the Central East Stroke Network website. Uh, and once that has happened, a link will be shared with anyone who registered for this webinar. And I would encourage you to please share with any of your colleagues who maybe weren't able to join today. Just in waiting to see if anyone does have any questions, I do want to thank you, Dr. Plowman, for presenting today. And I want to thank all of you as attendees for taking time in your day to join us for this webinar. Uh, there will be um, just a short survey at the end that's going to pop up at the end of the webinar, then I would encourage you to, to complete that. Uh, it provides feedback for us for future presentations. It's information that we can share with Dr. Plowman. So the first question that we have is, can you give us some ideas of how to incorporate aerobic exercise into an inpatient setting? Right. Um, so I, to me, I think that you have a couple of opportunities. You could have an aerobic group where uh, you might have arm bikes, you might have some leg bikes around your gym that you could have a group doing uh, 20 minutes of training outside of their therapy time. And, you know, you don't, uh, if you do the aerobics training, there's an aerobics uh, cl for clinicians training available through the Canadian uh, uh, Best Practices website. And you can estimate what max heart rate is. And if you're well below, if you're training in that 40%, you really do not need to have a fitness test. It's only if you're training into that high zone that you probably should have a fitness test and have the patient uh, you know, thoroughly screened in terms of having a stress test. So if you're in low, you can do two things. One, you can do that uh, the formula, you know, 220 minus your age, and you do 40% of that. And uh, monitor the heart rate like that or teach the patient to monitor their own heart rate. So you can use your existing equipment or you can tailor your floor. So your routines that you're doing on your mat, say you're rolling side to side, lying to sitting, sit to stand, 
uh, stepping forward, stepping up. You can you can structure that so you do ch you mix challenging with less challenging and and limit your breaks. That's one of the techniques I would do. Limit your breaks or say, okay, we're taking a 30 second rest or a one minute rest, and you actually time people and tell them to continue back on uh, with their training. So and you also measure their heart rate. I would measure heart rate, and you can you can easily stay into that 40 percent zone, you're still getting more aerobic training than they probably otherwise would be getting. And you're providing, to me, you're lifting your ceiling. So you're improving their capacity to participate in the training that they really need to do in order to promote neuroplasticity. So that's two, that would be two methods I think are realistic to you. And just building on that question, um, someone has asked, so if we were to use the floor routine for training, what monitoring should we use? And I know you said heart rate. Um, they're just asking, would you use pulse and ox O2 sat? I I would tend to use those on patients that I've already suspect. You know, I've on their first few days we're in the stroke unit, and I can see their sats tend to go down. Um, so I'd only you know, but for the most part, I think our patients like once they're in a rehab setting. Um, I don't know if the SATs are telling you a lot because you could be 94, 95, and that doesn't really tell you how intense your intervention is. So you need some kind of marker. The other thing is probably ask the patient. Uh, we are using the Borg scale from um, 0 to 10 or 1 to 10, um, and we try to train people in, the, in our high-intensity aspect. We go, say, 5, 6. And if we were low intensity, we're around three, four in terms of their, and we use the 10 point Borg scale because we found patients found it difficult to understand the 20. So, and we have happy faces. So we use the one that has the sad faces, happy faces, and then the sweating face, you know, the emojis. Um, and people understand that. So if you ask the patient where they're feeling in terms of level of perceived exertion, and you have heart rate between the two of those, you should be able to keep them in the 40%. Okay. Uh, one of the next questions is what type of evaluation is needed prior to starting an aerobic training? Often stress testing delays starting the program. Yeah. I think that unless you actually are going to train people in that vigorous intensity zone, the greater than 60% of their max, or estimated max, you probably don't need to do a stress test. It's going to be your clinical judgment because you're probably, you know, when you're doing regular therapy, you are up into the METs of 4, 4.5. So all you're doing with the aerobic exercise is you're staying there longer. So it's it's what you are doing. You use your clinical judgment. You're looking at the color of the lips. You're looking at, you're asking about their perceived exertion. You're looking for signs that the patient is too intensive for the patient. So I think about aerobic exercise much more practically. I don't think it, that we're going to ask patients to run on treadmill necessarily. I think we can do a lot of the tasks we're doing now but keeping in mind of getting that intensity up a little bit more. Um, someone was asking me about fear. I saw one comment in, uh, on the, the uh, question. Um, what we, we found, not with our functional training group, the, the activity group, they weren't fearful at all because we were doing tasks that they were familiar with. And had already done it in inpatient rehabilitation, and we and they had just been discharged, so they knew it. The treadmill was another kettle of fish. Uh, individuals were very fearful on the treadmill. Um, they told us that they thought they were going to they were fearful of pushing themselves because they thought they would have another stroke. Um, I think that was the biggest fear that people told us. So what we, the way we handle it is we said, we're pushing you to your maximum, but we're only training, you, we'll listen to you. If you tell us that you're out of your comfort zone in terms of your Borg perceived level of exertion, then we slow down. 
and we helped patients advance when they're, so we were using the body weight support harness. So if, if patients couldn't move their leg, we helped advance their leg, but fear was real. Um, the fortunate thing and the exciting thing was to watch people transition out of that fear. And over the 10 weeks of training, the, we saw fear being switched to confidence. And patients now began to say, you know what, I did it, and I was able to do it, and I, I realize now that I wasn't pushing myself as hard as I could have. And we had uh, no incidents, actually, in our trial. So we had 60 people participate in our trial. 30 of them were in the aerobic exercise group. So we had 30 people times 10 weeks times three times a week, so we'll do the math on however many hundreds of sessions that was, and we had no problems. We actually had one participant with atrial fibrillation, but she was stable and she was able to complete the trial. I think we can push patients more than we think. That was my, my takeaway from it. We just have a couple other questions, and um, certainly if there's others, perhaps um, I can send them to you directly, Dr. Plowman, afterwards, and we can follow up. But um, somebody was just asking, did you find a difference in recovery rate for time window and plateau phase for hemorrhagic versus ischemic stroke patients? And if we so, included both hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke in our group, but everyone was more than six months stroke and were discharged and finished therapy. So they would technically be in that plateau group, but you're exactly right. There is a different trajectory between your hemorrhagic and your ischemic stroke. There are hemorrhagic stroke initially in those first couple of weeks. They tend to look worse, but actually their recovery is a little bit better. Um, and the ischemic stroke patient, um, you see uh, they'll gradually start to improve more steadily over time. But in, it, but in our group, in the patients who participated in this study, they were all stable. Hmm. Uh, just another question. Uh, someone has commented that in their experience, most patients who can tolerate this level of physical activity get discharged. So sort of two questions. What kinds of programs should we be running for patients who have gone home? And what do we do with patients who can't tolerate this level of physical activity? Um, I think there's a couple of ways to deal with it. I, I think for sure we should start really early on explaining to patients that they have to move around, they have to get their heart rate up, um, or else, you know, we know that patients decline once they're discharged. That's a fact. And so they're probably declining. They're not neurologically declining. They're neuro they, you know, their impairment is stable. What's declining is their cardiorespiratory fitness. And it's now falling below that three met level. So now they can't walk around anymore. So I think we need to talk to patients about, and their families about, Staying active, and it's hard. It's hard, and the only thing I see hope for now is more community programs. So I turn to the Time program. We had another program here called NeuroFit, which I was involved in, and now we have Time. And I can tell you that our Time program is now that it's up and running, and they're in their second group. Uh, there's a waiting list. For that and the, the therapists are excited because they have somewhere we had no play we had no outpatient programs here in, in St. John's uh, very minimal outpatient programs and certainly no exercise programs in the community but you have to imagine that the reason your patients are declining post discharge is not because of their neurological impairment it's because their cardiovascular fitness is falling below the three men so the only way to do that is to try to keep them at least basic level of activity. Did you have any pushback from physicians about addressing aerobic training? Sometimes they can be a bit reluctant to promote. Um, 
we didn't have pushback from physicians. I think I'm, I just explained it the way I'm explaining it to you now, that this is a problem. So your patients can't fully participate in the therapy you have here in this facility because their fitness is too low to do it. Um, they're getting fatigued too early because they can't, because of their fitness. And then when they're discharged, they're going to continue to decline because their fitness falls below the METs required for ADL. So I think it's the message. I mean, we're not, we're not, here, we're not harming patients. We're just trying to train them in a zone that they need just, just for everyday life, just for everyday life. Thank you. So last question, are you going to be looking at high-intensity training intervals in future research? Um, I am not. There's people who are way ahead of my game now in terms of that. That is already being examined. I'll be interested in to see now how that turns out. Uh, we, so Mark Roig is a researcher at McGill, and he's already started a trial, so Let's keep our eye out on that, R-O-I-G, Mark Roy. He's a physiotherapist who specializes in this work and uh, in stroke. So let's watch for that. Uh, we just did a trial, actually, um, altitude training. So what we did is for patients who can't walk fast enough to get their heart rates up, what we did is we tried, we checked the safety and feasibility of doing altitude training. So as you know, you're walking. Uh, you know, at 7,000 meters or so, you don't have as much oxygen, so you feel the exertion is a lot higher. So that's what we're doing is testing to see whether for the patient, it seems like even though they're walking slower, their aerobic training levels are actually uh, higher because we're uh, limiting the amount of oxygen. So we, and we do that intermittently. They can't, and our studies show they can't tell when the valve is going in between uh, normoxic and um, altitude. So we're, I think we're thinking about ways to push the boundaries a little bit and because we know you need to train at that level to get the brain plasticity mechanisms activated. All right, thank you. I am going to uh, end the webinar here and I want to thank you again, Dr. Plowman, so much for presenting today. Um, I do see that there is definitely some interest in your article, so I would suggest, if you're willing, if you could send it to me, and then I can share with those attendees that would, would like the article. Yeah, I absolutely will. That would be great. Thank you. So thank you again to everyone who's participated. Please take a moment to, to complete the survey, and I wish you a safe journey home wherever you are, and have a good day. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>